Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we want to discuss the error of the once saved, always saved doctrine. Now, this is one form of eternal security. Uh, eternal security is a doctrine that was created by John Calvin in the 16th century. He created the form of it, which was perseverance of the saints, which is that as long as you, uh, or that God will make sure and ensure that his followers, his true followers, will endure in faith, in obedience, all the way to the end, not in perfection, but that he will make sure that they endure to the end so they inherit eternal life at the end. Now, I'm not going to address that error so much, but I'm going to go to the more extreme uh, error, the extreme form of this error, which is once saved, always saved. Now, this is an even later doctrine that was invented in the 19th century, that is in the 1800s, whenever dispensationalism rose up. And so in this doctrine, it says that even if, as long as you believe in Jesus Christ at one point, then you're saved and you're going to go to heaven no matter what. Even if you turn away into rebellion, to unbelief, you walk in sin, you become an atheist, you become a Mormon, whatever happens to you, you will have eternal life because it's a transaction that happens one time and after that, nothing that you do matters. And so I'm going to deal with that and uh, many of those that are in the pers perseverance of the saints camp, the Calvinist camp, will most likely agree with many of the things that I'm talking about because I'm not addressing the, their form of the error, but I'm addressing this more dangerous and extreme form of error, which is once saved, always saved. Okay, so uh, now as we do this, I'm going to focus not on the... I'm not going to focus on all the verses that are used, that are the, the proof texts that are quoted in order to say, look, it's true, we can't lose our salvation. I'm not going to go to those, but I'm going to focus on the big picture, the theological understanding of the scripture, that if we have a right theological understanding of the scripture as a whole and salvation and faith, if we understand these things correctly, then we won't be deceived into this dangerous era of once saved, always saved. Now, the first argument that is going to be given by those in the once saved, always saved, at least uh, by many of them, if you're uh, discussing with one of them about uh, you know, being able to lose your salvation, uh, then what they will bring up is they'll say, look, if we can lose our salvation, then that means it, by our works, then that means we're earning our salvation by our works. In other words, if, if I can do something that would cause my salvation to be lost, then that means it depended on my works in order to inherit eternal life and salvation. And so this is their argument, and uh, they misunderstand a lot of issues about salvation, about faith, and this shows their lack of understanding of it. So let's go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and I'm going to look at verse 8, and what I want to do here is to give us a paradigm about eternal life, about faith, uh, about salvation, so that we can understand what the Bible is talking about when it talks about giving us the gift of eternal life through faith in Christ. And uh, let's go ahead and Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8 says this. Now, this is God speaking to the Israelites that had already been 40 years in the wilderness. He was speaking to them before they went into the promised land to take this land, and he says this. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them and to their descendants after them. Now the verse here, it says, see, I have set the land before you. And some versions, some translations will say, see, I have given you the land. Okay, so we need to note here that God has given the land to them already. It is a gift. It is not something that, that they have earned. It's something that God has given them. But they have not yet uh, they have not yet experienced that or they've not yet come into that inheritance. They haven't yet experienced the promised land. They're still outside the promised land. Then God tells them, go in and possess the land. So my question is, if they go in to possess the land, now what did they do to possess the land? They had to go in by faith. They had to, they had to fight their enemies. They had to trust in God to deliver them from the power of, of of armies that were greater than them. They had to do something. They had to take action and go in. Now, when they went in and they fought and they took the land, was it no longer a gift from God? Because they had to do something, because they had to be active in it, did that mean that it wasn't given to them, but they earned it? No, they didn't earn it. God had already given it to them and God had promised it to them. It was a promise that they could have the land, but they were going to have to follow God into the promised land and trust him to deliver them from all of their enemies. And that's what they did. And that's under Joshua. They went in and took the land. Now, this is a picture and a type of our salvation. And so we'll, we'll get into that more, but this is a picture and a type. So 
They didn't already have the land. Let's also note that. It wasn't that God gave them the land and now they had it. No, God gave them the land as a promise and now they had to go in and actively pursue and take it. And when they did actively pursue and take it, it was not something they earned. It was a gift. So I want to go through and kind of lay out three theological or, or conceptual errors by those in the uh, once saved, always saved camp. Now, the first one is that they do not believe that we receive the promise of God through faith. Okay, let me say it again. Those in the once saved, always saved movement do not believe that we receive the promise of God through faith. Now, if there's anybody listening that is in that once saved, always saved camp, they'll say, no, 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 we're the ones that believe it's by faith. No, in the once saved, always saved movement, they don't believe in biblical faith. They don't believe they believe, receive the promise of God through a biblical faith. What they believe is that through believing a few facts that they receive a transaction, they receive eternal life. So especially those that are in the so-called free grace movement will always appeal to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verse 3 through, f 3 through 4, and they'll say, look, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose again according to the scriptures. If we believe those facts, then we have received eternal life and we can never die. Nothing that we can do, nothing that we can believe or not believe will ever take salvation and eternal life away from us because we already have it. So in that scenario, they're not having biblical faith. They don't believe they receive the promise of God through faith, through an act of faith. Instead, they believe that they receive eternal prom that, that they believe they receive eternal life through believing some facts. That is not faith. And so that's why I can say they don't believe we receive the promise of God through faith. They, they believe that we receive the promise of God or that they would receive eternal life through believing some facts. That is not faith, my friend. Faith is something that is active. Biblical faith is something that active is active. It moves us to work. It moves us to action. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, that faith, circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't matter, but faith that works through love. And so faith is an active thing, but those in the once saved, always saved movement think that faith just means belief of a few facts. This is not true. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3 to see this laid out clearly. Hebrews chapter 3. Let's go ahead and start in verse 7. Let me get there. Okay. Now start in verse 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope firm unto the end. So this is the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, we're part of God's house if, there's a condition, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope. This is describing faith. If we have an active and continuing faith, then and only then will we be eternally part of God's household. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope firm unto the end. This is not a one-time moment where we believe a few facts. This is a lifetime of trusting in the Son of God, in His promise, and pressing towards that actively, holding on to Him, holding on to that hope. This is what faith is biblically. And so those in the One Saved Always movement do not believe this. They believe that, no, it's just belief, that one-time moment of believing some facts. Not true. It's not true. Let's go on. And the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us He's going to compare, basically, the, the people of Israel, given the promise to, of the promised land and the fact that they need to go in and take it. And he's going to talk about those that came out of Egypt, which is a type and a shadow of coming out of bondage to sin, Satan, and the world. It's a type of being redeemed and being saved, coming out. But then, because of their rebellion in the wilderness, they weren't allowed to go in and ex receive the promised land. And the promised land in this is going to be a type for going in and experiencing eternal life, and the eternal kingdom of God. So verse 7 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of temptation in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years, Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So here's the picture. They were redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb. They were redeemed out of Egypt. They were brought out. They were given the law of God. They were made into God's holy people. And yet 
in the, in the hardness of their heart, they rebelled against God, and God rejected them and caused them to die in the wilderness. They were not allowed to enter into the promised land that he had promised to them. In the same way, if we receive a hardened heart and in rebellion turn away from the living God, then we will not enter into the promised land of eternal life. Now let's go on to verse 12 and we'll see that that's exactly what is being said here by the one writing Hebrews. Be attentive, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart and you depart from the living God. People can be in church and still have departed from the living God. Just like the people that rebelled against God in the wilderness, they were still in the camp of Israel, but they had rebelled against God and they had departed from the living God. And because of that, they did not enter the promised land. So here, the writer of Hebrews tells us, be attentive, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart and you depart from the living God. Well, why would it matter if they were unbelieving if they had already been saved out? As long as they believed in one moment, then it should be fine. No, because believing means something that we continue on. We hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of our hope firm until the end. Believe It's not just belief in a few facts in one moment, but it's holding on to the faith in God. So, it goes on, verse 13. We ask the question, well, how can you get a hardened heart? Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So by giving way to sin, not walking in holiness, not walking in obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ, we will harden our hearts through the deceitfulness of sin. It will get a hold of us. And when we have a hard and a, a hard heart, what will it cause us to do? We will be unbelieving and we will walk away from the living God. We will no longer hold fast our confidence and our faith. So sin will take away our saving faith. Sin will cause us no longer to trust in God, but we will rebel against him instead. Verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ and we hold the beginning of our confidence firmly to the end. Here again, we have it. As long as we hold the confidence, we don't let sin lead us away into unbelief, but we hold firm our confidence, then we will, uh, from the beginning until the end, then we will be partakers of Christ. We will share in his inheritance. We will share in his kingdom. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Verse 16, for who were they who heard and rebelled? Was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with those who had sinned, whose bodies fell into the world in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who disobeyed? So because of their sinful, hard hearts, they rebelled against God. They lived in disobedience to him. They walked away from God, even though they were still in the camp of Israel. So is it disobedience or is it faith? Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. This is what those in the One Saved Always movement do not understand. They do not understand the meaning of biblical faith. And so because they don't understand, they, they don't realize that in order to be saved and have eternal life, you must have faith in Jesus Christ. Not in one moment believing things, but we must entrust ourselves to him, which means then we will walk with him and we will guard ourselves from sin because if we walk into sin, we will have a hardened heart that walks away from God. You can't walk with God. You can't walk with the son of God while you're walking in rebellion to him. You can't be his enemy and have peace with him at the same time. If we're reconciled to God, we need to be walk with God. How can two walk together unless they agree? They cannot. We cannot walk with God and fight against him at the same time. We must continue in an ongoing faith, hold our confidence firm unto the end, and then we will partake in Christ. Just like those in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8, that if they, by faith, they go in and they fight all the enemies of the land, they go in, they take Jericho, they go in and they take all the kings one by one and all the lands that are greater than them, one by one, they continue to fight the fight of faith then they will inherit it. They won't earn it, but they will inherit the land that was promised to them by God as a gift. Now, what's the second error we want to look at? The second error, and it's kind of already come up a little bit, but the error is this. We already have it. We already have eternal life. Now, the Bible seems pretty clear that it says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. If we were to flip over to uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse, uh, verse 11, it says that this is the promise that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. And so the idea is that, oh, we already have it. We have eternal life. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. And so 
the idea in the mistake is that we have eternal life in and of ourselves. Just like the Israelites in the wilderness could say, oh, God already promised, God already gave us the land, so now since he gave it to us, we have it. No, they didn't have it. In the same way, we don't yet have eternal life. We have it, but we don't have it. What do we mean by this? Let's go ahead and look in. Now, you know, if we haven't been saved yet, if, if it's true, what we're going to look into here, that, that actually we haven't been saved yet, we don't yet have eternal life, then it doesn't mean that we lose it. It means that we haven't yet obtained it. We haven't yet inherited. We haven't yet got the inheritance. And so when we look here, the one of the things that is often said, well, something we already have, we can't lose. Since we already have eternal life and eternal life lasts forever, then we can't lose it. But that's the mistake. We don't yet have it in ourselves. Okay? It's a grave misunderstanding. Uh, let's go ahead and look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, first let's look at verse 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. So it looks like we do have it. So maybe did I misspeak by saying that we don't yet have eternal life, that we don't yet have our inheritance? Because here it says, the Spirit himself bear witness that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Well, then I guess we've already got it. No, it goes on. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. That if isn't very important. It goes on, verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. So we are already the children of God, right? We're already the heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. But yet the scripture is telling us that we're not yet. We haven't yet received the inheritance and we haven't yet experienced that and tasted of that inheritance. So now let's go down a couple of verses and look at verse 22. We know that the whole world groans and travails in pain until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan within ourselves while we eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Okay? In verse 16, it seemed pretty clear that we were already children of God, that we had already been adopted. But now, here in verse 23, it's telling us that we're eagerly waiting for our adoption. Waiting when we receive the inheritance of a resurrected body, we receive eternal life. Here's the fact. We do not yet have eternal life because we're going to die. If we had eternal life, we would not die. Uh, our, our bodies wouldn't go into the grave. We wouldn't. We, resurrected life is what we're waiting for. This is the hope of eternal life. That Not that we're, our spirits are going to fly away and go and be in heaven. No, the hope of eternal life is that like Jesus Christ, we would be resurrected from the dead, body, soul, and spirit, that we would be made alive and we would never die. We have not yet experienced that. When the Bible says that those that believe have eternal life, we have to be very carefully. We understand that that is in promise. We have it in a promise. We have it in the promise of Jesus Christ. We don't have it in and of ourselves. If we flip over to, or so let's keep going on this verse here. So eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 24. If I were to ask you, are you saved? We can say in one sense, yeah, I was saved by grace through faith. I trusted in Christ and I was reconciled to God. I was saved. Okay? But in another way, we can say we have not yet been saved. And this is what Paul is speaking of here. Verse 24. For we are saved through hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does a man still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Here again, we see that wait for it with patience. There's Something ahead that we're looking for. There's a promise that's been given to us, a hope that we have that we're looking towards and that by faith, we're clinging to that promise. We're holding on to that promise. We're waiting for it patiently. This is biblical faith. This is what once saved, always saved doesn't believe, that we have to hold on to the promise of eternal life. If we flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says this in verse 12. Speaking to Timothy, Paul says this. Now, he was, he was saved. He was, uh, okay, let's look at verse 11. But you, O man of God, escape these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Did Timothy have eternal life? 
The answer is yes and no. If we don't understand that, we won't understand the Bible and we might fall into the error of once saved, always saved. Yes, we have it in a promise. Yes, we have it in Jesus Christ, but not in ourselves. We have the promise of eternal life. But here he says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. There's another sense in which we have not yet received eternal life. We're waiting for the resurrection of our body and we will receive that inheritance if we hold our, our confidence firm until the end. If we, if we turn away, if we turn away from Christ and we turn away from that hope and we turn away from that active faith, then we also turn away from the inheritance that is waiting for us. We must go on, we must lay hold on eternal life by fighting the good fight of faith. Again, it's not just believing a few facts in one moment of time, but it's trusting in Christ all the way to the end. It's not something that we've already received in, uh, in ourselves. No, we're still going to die. It's something we received as a promise in Jesus Christ who has already risen from the dead and he is at the right hand of God and he has eternal life. In him is life and we have life in him. Now let's go to uh, one of the common verses that are quoted by those in the once saved, always saved camp, especially those in the so-called free grace camp, they will come and they'll say, look, and this is, this is something that is endlessly drawn. Verse 11, chapter 5, 1 John 5, 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Boom. If you have eternal life, it's eternal. If it doesn't last forever, then you didn't really receive eternal life. And so it's not eternal and God's a liar. Here he says, and this is the testimony that God has, past tense, given us eternal life. But the question is the next phrase. And this life is in his son. So it's like our hope, our inheritance has been laid up and stored up in heaven. Where has it been stored up in heaven? In Jesus Christ, because all the blessings, all the spiritual blessings of God are in Christ Jesus, seated right there, waiting for us. They've been put in that safety deposit box there in Jesus Christ. And now how are we going to get to that inheritance? We need to fight the good fight of faith. We need to hold firmly in our confidence, firm unto the end, so that we will be able to be partakers of Christ. Because it, our inheritance is not in us. We do not yet have eternal life in ourselves. No, we have it in Jesus Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. And we must walk with him firm until the end so that we can receive that inheritance. If indeed we suffer with him so that we might be glorified with him. This is the clear teaching of scripture. And it goes on in verse 12. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Maybe you, at some point, you believed in Jesus, maybe you repented, trusted in Christ, you were walking with Christ, and then you, you started to struggle, and then you started to feel condemned, and then you got deceived in, by these men, uh, you know, that tell you that, oh, no, no, it's okay, you're secure, don't feel condemned, don't feel like you have to uh, strive to enter eternal life and to strive to enter into the rest, don't, no, don't feel any of that, as long as you believed in the past, you're safe, you're good to go, no matter what happens, even though you live in sin, you're all right, and you believe that. Well, listen to this very carefully. That means you don't have the Son of God. You've walked away from Him. You're no longer trusting in Him. You're no longer walking, depending on Him, clinging to Him. Instead, you're walking in sin and rebellion to Him. You're walking as His enemy. And this is what the Scripture said. Whoever has the Son has life. If you do not have the Son right now, you do not have life because eternal life is not in you. It's in the Son. It's not something that God gave to you by yourself, like some money that you could go spend at the mall. No, he didn't give it to you. He gave you Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has all the riches and all the glory of God. As long as you're with him, you have it, and when you walk away from him, you do not have it. Whoever has the Son, in the present tense, has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. We need to be very clear about this. It goes on in verse 13, it makes it even clearer. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So if we believe in the Son of God, we're trusting in Him, we're clinging to Him, we have an active faith following after Him, then we have eternal life. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, gratefully, many of those that are in the so-called free grace movement are also caught up into extreme forms of dispensationalism like mid-acts dispensationalism they're also caught up into the strange doctrines of king james onlyism so that means that they use a king james bible 
which is a, a Textus Receptus Bible. It comes from a particular manuscript, so it would include this. If you use some other versions, maybe it doesn't include, but in the King James, it includes eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So it's something we must continue to do. That's why it says in Hebrews that we hold our confidence firm to the end. And if we do, we will inherit and partake of Christ's inheritance. That deposit which is up there waiting for us at the right hand of God in Jesus Christ. Eternal life in him, not in ourselves. If we flip over to uh, first, or Colossians. Here. Find it. Colossians. Let's see. Colossians chapter 3 says this, If you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above where Christ, is, Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So our life is hidden in Christ, not in ourselves. We don't have it in ourselves. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then also you shall appear with him in glory. So we die to the old life, and we live to the new life clinging to Jesus Christ because that's where our hope is. We don't live for this world. We live for him. It goes on in verse 5. Therefore, put to death the parts of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of those things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. If we turn back to those things, if we turn back to the flesh and live according to the flesh, we will perish. Because we will be sons of disobedience, we will not be the sons of the living God. This is how we know who the sons of God are, it says in 1 John chapter 3. Those that practice righteousness, those that obey him, they are the children of God. Those that practice sin are of the devil, they are not born of God. And so we need to be clear if we're walking with him or not. Our life is seated at the right hand of God with Jesus Christ. Let me put it this way. So we haven't already have it. It's something future. It's something that... We've been given in a promise, and we've been, it's been deposited into Jesus Christ. So the error, we already have it. No, we don't. We don't have it in ourselves. We have it in a promise that is in Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to the third error. The third error. There is no effort or action on our part. There is no effort or action on our part in order to inherit eternal life. We believed one time we had... Uh, accepted some facts, and since we accepted those facts, it's all said and done. There's no effort or action on our part. This is not true. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. If you'll see that the, the big error is a misunderstanding of faith, it's a misunderstanding of the promise of eternal life being uh, that we have already been saved and yet not already saved, and so these are two errors. Now here's another one that this misunderstanding of what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Now it starts off in verse 1. Now the faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm. How does that fit with what we're talking about? Because eternal life is hoped for. We don't yet have it. We don't yet see it. We're still going to die. The grave still takes us. And so because of that, we don't yet have it, but we have it in hope because we believe Jesus is risen from the dead and he has eternal life and he is going to give it to all those that are waiting for him when he returns. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We do not yet see Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, but we, we believe that he is there, that he is risen, and we rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. And so we keep our rejoicing in hope until the end. We have hope, something that we do not yet see. Why does a man hope for what he already sees? He does not, Romans chapter 8 said. So we are not yet saved in the full sense of being resurrected from the dead, the adoption of sons, Romans chapter 8, verse 23. But so let's go to verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out into a place which he would later receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. God had promised Abraham that he would inherit a land that he had never seen. So did Abraham stay in uh, where he was at and say, okay, God promised it to me, it's mine. I have it, I've already got it. Did he just say like, oh no, I believe it since I believe it, I don't need to do anything to gain it. No, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. So God said, I promise to give you this land, now leave where you're at and go and get it. And so he believed God 
And therefore, he left where he was and he obeyed God and went in and took it. This is biblical faith. Biblical faith is not just believing something. Biblical faith has action. It has something that we are active in pursuing the, the reality. Abraham promised land. He entered by faith. He didn't earn it. It doesn't mean that, well, you're saying he obeyed, so he earned the promised land because he left where he was and he went. No, he didn't earn it. He was promised it. And then by faith, he went to it. And so in the same way for us, we don't earn eternal life, but we have to walk to it. We have to fight the fight of faith and we have to uh, hold on to the faith and go all the way to the end so that we can receive the inheritance. The inheritance that's been promised to us and the inheritance that's already been given through faith and in hope in Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. This is very clear from the scripture. It's not something that should be misunderstood. He didn't earn it, but he had to go to it. Abraham had to go to it. He had to obey. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Jesus is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We must obey the Lord. There is no faith if we don't obey the Lord. If we, God commands us something and we don't obey it, we don't believe him. We, we, don't believe, we just simply do not believe him. That is not biblical faith. The nature of faith is active. In, uh, in, in James chapter 2, verse 22, it says, You see, this is Abraham when he went to the land, and then he offered up his son Isaac. Uh, or, or in, he wasn't in the land yet. Uh, or was he? Yeah, he was in the land already. And he offered up his son Isaac in James chapter 2, verse 22. You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. What does it mean, faith was perfected? It means that that was real faith. Uh, real faith has works. Real faith is active. And so whenever somebody says, well, I believe Jesus and they live in rebellion to him, they do not believe Jesus is Lord and yet they walk in rebellion to him. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 46, that why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You have to confess Jesus as Lord to be saved. But when you confess Jesus as Lord, he's going to say you, do, you don't believe him. You have no faith whatsoever if you don't obey him. Why would you call him Lord, Lord, and not obey what he says? And so faith is active. It obeys. The, the biblical faith, the faith that saves, the faith that is alive, the faith that is, is saving of our souls is a faith that is active. A faith that is just believing facts is not true. Active faith believes facts and acts upon them. That is real faith. So it's not merely believing certain facts, but seeking them. Here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, you know, we already saw in verse a, that by faith Abraham obeyed, and we see throughout the book of Hebrews, that's the whole point. By faith, you know, Abel offered uh, to, to God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken to heaven. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned, obeyed, and godly fear prepared the ark. We see all of this, but then verse, uh, verse uh, 6, it gives us a clear definition of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he exists. Okay, so if we stop there, We'd say, so faith means that we believe that God exists. Yeah, you can't, you can't have faith in God if you don't believe that he exists. You must believe that he exists. But that is not faith. Believing God exists is not biblical faith. And, it goes on, and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So believing and diligently seeking equals biblical faith. If we don't have diligently seeking, if we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then we do not believe that Jesus is the king at all. We don't believe in the kingdom of God. We believe in our own sin. We believe in our own ways. We believe in this world. And we don't believe in Jesus Christ. My friend, if you're living in rebellion to God, you are not a believer in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you were born in the South in America and you grew up believing. It doesn't matter you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter whether you have a theology degree. It doesn't matter. You are not a Christian. You are not a believer in Jesus Christ, my friend. Because somebody that has faith in Jesus Christ does believe that he exists, but more than that, he believes that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And you know when they believe that, you know what that causes people to do when they believe that God is diligent, uh, diligent rewards those that seek him? They seek him. And not only is he the rewarder of those that diligently seek him, he is the one that is going to bring wrath on those that ignore him. And if we believe that, we will tremble at his word and we will walk in obedience to him. My friend, don't be fooled into the silly notions that are taught in this once saved, always saved jargon, this new and novel doctrine that was made up in the 19th century and was never heard about anywhere in church history before that. They'll say, oh, but we have verses. No, you misunderstand verses. You misquote verses because you don't even understand the basic things of the word of God. 
When you hear in the word of God that it says that you have eternal life, you think that you're going to live forever without dying. My friend, you're mistaken. We have eternal life in Jesus Christ, not in ourselves. We have it as a hope and a promise that's seated at the right hand of God, waiting for those that diligently seek God. It's the reward that they will get if they diligently seek him, trusting in him. Do they earn it? They don't earn it. It's already been purchased. It's already sitting there and waiting, but we have to go to it just like Abraham left his land and he went to a land that he didn't know it. He, no, he obeyed God and he went and received the inheritance and we must go and we must receive that inheritance. My friend, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by slick talking people that have slick little arguments, but they're ignorant of the word of God. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand the scriptures. They don't understand salvation. They don't understand faith. They don't understand eternal life. They don't understand covenant, the new covenant. They don't understand any of these things, but they boast so heavily. Be careful of these. Be careful of these. These are dangerous men because they sound so smart. And yet the Bible says they are fools. They are deceived and they are deceiving. Do not be duped. Error number four. Error number four is that salvation is transactional, not relational. That's why these men will say, once saved, always saved. I already made the deal. I already believed the thing. I already prayed the prayer or believed the 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. I, I, I believed it. I'm set. It's already, it's already done. We're all good. It's all good to go. What? do You, have, you made a deal with God? You made a transaction with God? This is, this is nonsense. This is silly. What is the way to heaven? How do you get to heaven? Is it by believing that Jesus died and rose again? No, my friend. You don't get to heaven by believing that. You indeed do not get to heaven by believing that. Well, let's go see what Jesus says the way to heaven is. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. So he's going back to the Father. Okay? It's very clear. Jesus Christ is going back to the Father. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Okay? He goes in. He is the one, the high priest that goes in beyond the veil. He's the one representing. He's our hope. He's the one that's overcome death, hell, and the grave. He's the one that has eternal life to offer those that trust in him. Verse 4, you know where I am going and you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So what is the way? Is the way to make a deal with God, to believe certain facts, and then after that, do whatever you want? Now, some will say, oh, but, but those in the free grace camp or those in the once saved, always saved, it doesn't mean that they live in sin and that they just go out and do what they want freely. No, it does not. There are many people that believe this doctrine and believe it inconsistently, and yet they fear God and they walk in holiness. I have no doubt that that is true. Uh, they, gratefully, they don't make that a central doctrine like those in the, the free grace camp will make it a central doctrine, and they'll say, no, once saved, always saved. If you don't believe that, you're going to hell. Some, some in, that, in that camp. And so uh, you might be in the free grace movement. You might be deceived by those in the once saved, always saved camp. You might, and you might be living a godly life and you're walking with Christ. You have bad doctrine. Uh, you have, you're actually believing something that's very heretical, very unorthodox. But just that alone doesn't make you a heretic. Just that alone doesn't mean that you've walked away from God. No, because Jesus is the way. Let's see here. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What's the way to heaven? What's the way to God? It's through Jesus Christ. Not through believing Jesus Christ at one time, but through walking with him. He is the way. He's the way that we walk with him. He's the life. His life is in him, not in us. He's the truth. What does it mean that the life is in him? Look, if I look at the story of the prodigal son, was the prodigal son rich or poor? When he was with the father, he was rich. He had everything he needed. When he walked away from the father, he had nothing. Everything that he seemed to have just all disappeared. You see, those in the, the once saved, always camp, they think that salvation, that eternal life is given to them in a moment. They have it. It belongs to them. It's a transaction. It's in their hand. But when they walk away from God, it will disappear just like all the inheritance that was received by the prodigal son. When he got to the, the land, there was a famine. All his money was gone. He had nothing left and he was dying of starvation. This is what it means to walk away from God. But when he returned back to the father, then he had everything that he needed again. He had no needs. 
He was, he was with every, he had everything because the Father had it all. In the same way, Jesus Christ has life. Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is the truth. If we walk with him, if we stay close to him, if we cling to him, then we have life. We have life in the Son of God, not in ourselves. We hold to him. It's a covenant relationship, not a transaction, not something that we got a long time ago and now we've got it and it's ours and it's eternal and it can never be taken away. No, we don't have eternal life. We have the Son of God in a relationship. And in that relationship, because he has life, we have life. When we break off that relationship, we also break off away from life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not some transaction that you made with God, but Jesus Christ through covenant relationship, not through a transaction. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. There are certain things that we can discuss. I mean, I get heated sometimes when I talk about, you know, Calvinism. Uh, you know, Calvinism has a lot of things that, that really uh, confuse disciples as well as twist the word of God as well as uh, you make God look, uh, they ba basically blaspheme God without knowing it. They, they paint God in a, in, a, in a way that's not good. But all of that said and done, it is not nearly as dangerous as this stuff. Because even in the ideas of Calvinism where they talk about perseverance of the saints, they still acknowledge the fact that we must walk with Jesus Christ into the end. Now, they'll come in with philosophy and say that, yeah, but uh, it's, uh, God is going to ensure that we do it and he'll deterministically cause us to do it by his own irresistible grace. Okay, yeah, they've got that, they add that, but they walk in the right way. They walk according, they don't just accept that we're saved by grace, but they also know that we're going to be judged by works. And they have a system of working that together. But when it comes to this once saved, always saved, especially those that are in the free grace camp that push it to such an extreme and become so uh, legalistic and so, uh, so judgmental towards others in it that they, they're, they're the ones and they're only they're the ones that have, that have the, the truth and, and they become so arrogant and prideful, this is dangerous stuff. This is demonic and evil stuff. This is very, very evil stuff. So uh, we need to be very careful about this. Uh, there is a lot of different errors, a lot of things we can debate. No, none of us are going to agree about every single thing, but this stuff is completely unorthodox, completely heretical, and very, very dangerous. And so please stay away from this so-called once saved, always saved stuff, especially the the forms of it that put it, make it, emphasize it as something very important to salvation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Now this is still, if you go through and read the context, you read in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, you're talking about faith, talking about all the examples of those that live by faith. And then it says, now those are examples so that we need to follow in that same way, that in the same way they inherited the promises, they were pushing forward to something that they had an act of faith, we should do the same thing. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, by the time it gets over to uh, verse 14, he's talking about He's comparing it with Hebrews chapter 11 and going in and inheriting the promised land, the, the, the place that we need to inherit by faith, an act of faith. Verse 14, pursue peace with all men and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord, watching diligently so that no one falls short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up to cause trouble and many become defiled by it. Lest there be any sexually immoral or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know at, that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So he uses Esau as another type and a shadow. That he despised his birthright, he despised his inheritance. And we, if we become immoral, if we become uh, you know, filled with bitterness and idolatry, if we, be, if we don't pursue holiness then we will not receive the inheritance. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. It's very clear that this is something that we must do. Now, this brings up another issue. You know, it's kind of a side issue, but it's really important. When people have this idea when they say, well, you know, I believed in Jesus, and so I can't lose my salvation. Uh, you know, I'm going to go to heaven uh, no matter what. They really think of salvation as going to heaven. This is not what salvation is. Salvation is being reconciled to the living God. What is eternal life? Eternal life is not going to heaven. In fact, the Bible says at the end of the book, 
that God is going to come down and dwell with men. And so we need to understand that eternal life is not that we're going to go to heaven. And so this idea that, okay, I got saved and now I'm going to heaven no matter what. Yeah, I still smoke pot. Yeah, I still watch pornography. Yeah, I still do these things, but I'm going to heaven. My salvation is secure. That's not salvation, my friend. That's a delusion. And that's a selfish delusion at that. The choice is not between going to heaven or going to hell. The choice is between being reconciled to God and walking with him or choosing our own way and walking in rebellion and sin. That's the choice. So salvation, you know, when we say holiness, what does holiness mean? Well, in one sense, it means to be consecrated and set apart for God. Okay, so if we're consecrated and set apart for God, that means we're walking with God. We, we know him. We love him. We serve him. We're walking with him. That's salvation. That is salvation, to be reconciled to God. Jesus said, he didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and life. Whoever, uh, no one comes to heaven except through me. He said, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent, to know him. 1 John chapter 2, verse uh, 3 and 4, maybe it says, if anyone says that he knows him and does not obey his commandments, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. To know Jesus Christ is to have life. To know Jesus Christ, to know the Father. This is what salvation is. Holiness is salvation. It's not that we're holy to earn salvation. No, God has, we were rebels against God and he sent his son to die on a cross and then to call us back to be reconciled, forgiven of our sin, brought back into right relationship with God, filled with his Holy Spirit so that we can have access to the Father through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit and we can walk with him, that we can have eternal life in him. Oh, my friend, this idea that, I guarantee these people that live in sin now, this is not everybody in the OS, you know, in the once saved, always saved camp, but those that live in sin and think that they're going to heaven, if they went to heaven, they would hate it because in heaven you do the will of God, not our own will. And so these people don't understand what they're asking for. They say, oh yeah, yeah, I believed in Jesus and, and I'm going to heaven no matter what I do. No, you're not going to heaven. And if you did go to heaven, you would hate it because God reigns there. You don't reign. You don't get to do whatever you want. You don't get to live according to the flesh and your own flesh of the desires, but you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And when you're in heaven, that will be the joy of every believer is that we are with him. Because, you know, it's even questionable. Is heaven up there or is heaven coming down? Because the scripture says heaven is coming down. God is going to restore this earth. He's going to make, make a new creation, and God is going to come dwell among men. That is heaven. That is eternal life to be and to know him. And so this idea that the main thing is that you choose heaven and not hell and you, you believe in Jesus and you pray a prayer, that's not what it's about. No, it's you're an enemy of God, but he loves you and he sent his son for you and he desires to be reconciled. If you will turn back to him, submit to his son, Jesus Christ, he will forgive your sins, he will give you his spirit and he will fellowship with you and walk with you forever, forever if you will trust in him. So, we need to understand. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 6, or I'm uh, not sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Very famous passage that is often quoted. It's part of the so-called Romans road. It's quoted endlessly by those in the uh, free grace camp. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, first of all, let me point out again, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not just in ourselves, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it says it's the gift. So the argument is, Look, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is something you can't earn. It's something you cannot earn. That's true. Something you can't earn. Just like the Israelites were given as a gift, they were given the promised land. They couldn't earn it, but they did have to go in and take it. And so here in this verse, when it says, for the wages of sin is death, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It says in, in Galatians, chapter, Galatians chapter 6, verse uh, 8. If you live according to the flesh, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. You will die. Okay? It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, he who lives according to the flesh will die. Okay? So, so that's clear. So for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. The life is in him. He's the way to the Father. Uh, this is all very clear. But what does this process look like? So those in the, the, the once saved always camp want to say that this is not a process. This is a one-time transaction. Let's go back one verse before, a verse that is rarely quoted, especially by those in this camp. Let's actually jump up here. Uh, let's go ahead, just to get some context. Let's jump back up to verse 16. Do you not know that those that to whom you yield yourselves slaves to obey, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? 
whether of sin leading to death. Now, this is talking to Christians. This is not talking to unbelievers. This is talking to Christians. Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. As it says in 1 John chapter 3, it says, those that practice righteousness are righteous. Don't let anybody deceive you. Those that practice righteousness are righteous. Those who practice sin are of the devil. Okay? So obedience leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, for you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching which you were entrusted. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you have yielded your members, so it's something we actively do, you yielded your members as slaves to impurity and iniquity, leading to more iniquity. What is the greatest punishment for sin? More sin. We see that in Romans chapter 1, that God handed them over. Because of their idolatry, he handed them over to all kinds of vile desires. So sin leads to more sin. Okay. Even so now, yield your members, something we actively do. This is faith. This is faith something we actively do. Even so, yield your members as slaves to righteousness unto holiness. So obedience leads to righteousness. Righteousness is walking in holiness, being set apart for God. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit did you have from the things for which you are now ashamed? The result of those things is death. Living in sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now look at verse 22, the one right before verse 23. But now, having been freed from sin and having become slaves of God, you have fruit unto holiness, and the end is eternal life. Okay? We obey. We yield ourselves and obey in righteousness. This leads to holiness, consecration of God. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. What is the end of holiness? The end of holiness is eternal life. So eternal life then our holiness leads to eternal life. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So what about verse 23? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Yes, through walking in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, not a transaction, but in a relationship, a covenant with him, clinging to him, holding to him, uh, you know, holding your confidence firm to the end, rejoicing in hope all the way to the end. Then we will partake in him. Our life is in him. This is, this is so clear. So, it's not saying the gift of God is one-time transaction and that now you've got it. No, the gift is through Jesus Christ, so cling to him. He is your life. They, Jesus was saying hard things in John chapter 6, and the disciples, you know, many began to leave him, and he asked his disciples, do you want to leave us also? And Peter said, where can we go? Where can we go? We believe that you have the words of eternal life. And so they clung, clung to him. They stayed with him. And we must stay with him all the way to the end in order to inherit eternal life because eternal life is through him. It's in him. You have fruit unto holiness and the end is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the gift of God. Do we earn it through holiness? No, we do not. That is our part of our salvation that we have holiness in him, that he gives us his spirit and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we walk in holiness. That we're walk, what's holiness? Consecrated to God, that we know God, that we walk with him. We're no longer alienated and strangers from him, but we're walking with God. Eternal life is to know him. This is what salvation is, okay? Let's go to Hebrews chapter three again. Getting ready to close up here. Hebrews chapter three. If I can find Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. We already covered it, but I want to just look at it again after we have some understanding in our, in our mind here. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence firmly to the end. So, we see that in one sense, we've already become partakers of Christ. We're sharing in him. We, we share his Holy Spirit. We share his Father. Uh, you know, we share the life that is in him that comes and, and wells up in us and springs up into eternal life. Uh, these things we're already partaking of. But there's also a future that we're waiting for that we're going to partake of the eternal life that is in him, not in us. It's, it's in him. It's at the right hand of God. It's an inheritance kept for us, unspoiled and undefiled, sitting at the right hand of God in Jesus Christ, the eternal life that is in him. But what we have to do is have an act of faith. We have to hold the beginning for, uh, of our confidence firmly to the end. It's something that we have to walk in. We're saved through faith, not saved through believing some facts, Saved through faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in him, clinging to him, walking in him. 
1 John chapter uh, 5, we already looked in verse 12 and 13. It says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's a relationship. It is not a transaction. It is a covenant. This is why those that have a transaction idea in their mind, they think that they've, it's a strange, unbiblical concept. They think that, okay, I believed, then I got eternal life and I've got it. And then you say, well, you can lose your salvation. They're like, well, what, how, what am I going to do? Lose it? If I lose it, it wasn't eternal. So it's like, how can I lose it? You know? And so then they fight for this idea of I, I'm going to, I have it no matter what happens in my life. But that's not the way it is. It's, it's a covenant relationship. It's in Jesus Christ. So if we're walking with him in fellowship with him, we have it. And if we don't, we don't. This yeah, I, I can't see it any clearer at this point, I guess. But it, it's not a transaction, my friend. It's, it's, it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 John, or not 1 John, chapter, John chapter 15, verse 10. You know, if, you're, if you get sucked into things like once saved, always saved, then it, it, it twists your mind. Uh, because then you get this mindset, okay, transaction, and then that's what salvation is, and salvation is going to heaven, so if I live in sin, it's okay, I'm still going to heaven. All these kind of mind, it's, it's a twisting of the mind, so then that affects so much how we read the Bible elsewhere. So when we read other things that we're going to be judged by our works, we can't make any sense of that, because how could I be judged by my works? I'm already, I already have eternal life. It's already, the transaction deal's already done. And so uh, these things are dangerous not only because they, they, it's one error, but because then it leads into a multitude of errors. And so you get involved in one saved, always saved, then you're going to have a hard time reading some of the other things Jesus says. For example, in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, Jesus gives the parable of the vine and the branches. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who, bear, who abides in me will bear much fruit. He, uh, who, he who is in me but does not bear fruit will be cut off and cast into the fire. Okay, these things are, are, are very, very clear. But then we ask the question, well, how does one abide in him? We know that eternal life is in him. He's the vine. It's not us. No, there's no life in us. The life is in him, and we have that life as long as we're, we're, we're clinging to him. Well, how do we abide in him? He tells us, in, starting in verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. What do we do with this? Do we become dispensationalists because we, we don't know how to deal with obeying commandments? You know, some people will become dispensationalists and say, okay, I believe in one saved, always saved. So what Jesus is saying here that we remain in his love, we abide in him if we obey his commandments. Well, that can't be because I'm already saved no matter what. Uh, and so I can't be cast out from the vine, so this must be wrong. So then they become dispensationalists and they say, everything Jesus said before that had to do with the gospel of the kingdom. You know, and then it's only after the book of Acts that the new gospel comes. Then we go and read over in John chapter, First John chapter two, where it says that if someone says that they know him and does not obey his commandments, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, then we say, well, now we better become mid-Acts dispensationalists because that means even John and maybe Peter are some, saying some things that are, don't fit up with our once saved, always saved doctrine. So then mid-Acts, what they say is that, man, it doesn't even start until Paul. Only Paul is the one that's going to teach Christian truth. Jesus didn't teach it and Peter didn't teach it, and John didn't teach it. They were just teaching the gospel of the kingdom, which is totally different than the gospel that we believe. And so you see how one error can lead to so many things. But the fact is, our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, those in the mid-axis dispensation will say, we follow Paul because Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, okay, I'm going to follow Paul. Paul followed Christ, so I'm going to do what Paul did, and I'm going to follow Christ, okay? And Jesus said this, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain him in love. This is faith. If you do not believe that he is Lord, you will not believe, obey him as Lord. If you say you believe in him as Lord, but you don't obey him, you do not. You do not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ obeys him. Does it say here that we obey perfectly? No. The parable talks about pruning those that bear fruit so that we can bear more fruit. God disciplines us in our, uh, in our life. We have a throne of grace that we can come to. It's not perfect obedience, but it is consistent obedience. As, Je as Peter, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, that by continuance and perseverance in doing good. It's not a, a, it's not a, a, perfect, a perfection thing. It's a matter of obeying him. It's a faith thing that we walk in faith. Now, in conclusion, let's go back to our, our first verse and look at this and see how this gives us a, a, a paradigm to see salvation in Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord has swore to your fathers. So, 
God has given us the promised land of eternal life. That eternal life is in his son and it's, it's in a deposit in his son at the right hand of God right now. But we have to go in and take it. How can we take it? How can we live holy? How can we fight the battles? They had to go in and they had to fight in Jericho. They had to go in and fight all the different battles that they had to fight to take it. They weren't earning it. It was already given to them. It was an already inheritance. It was promised to them. It was the promised land. But they had to go in and take it. They had to have an active faith that moved them to action. And when they moved to action, what, what did they have faith in? Did they have faith in a transaction they made with God in the past? No, they had faith in the risen Son of God. As, as Jesus appeared to them and, you know, as the angel of the Lord and said, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither. He says, no. He says, I am the, I am the, 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 the captain of the Lord of hosts. And so we follow the captain of the Lord of hosts and we follow after him and we trust in him and he will defeat our enemies. How do we fight the good fight of faith? By clinging to him, obeying him, trusting him, trembling at his word, rejoicing in his promises, holding fast to all of his promises, keeping his commandments. This is how we abide in him and hold to him and this is how we go in and take the land and inherit eternal life. It's something that we've been promised in Jesus Christ but we must go in and take it. This is not earning our salvation. It's not even losing our salvation. You know, what does it mean to lose our salvation? We don't even have it yet. We're going in to take it. We only have it in the promise. We only have it in a deposit. We only have it in, we've tasted of the powers of the age to come, but we don't have, have them in fullness. We've already been adopted as the son of God and received the spirit of God, but we're going we're gonna to be part of God's household if we endure to the end. If we suffer with him, then we will be glorified with him. Then we will be adopted as his sons at the resurrection of the dead. And so we need to have these concepts. So the first one, the first one we need to understand is that faith is something that is active. We receive it through an active and continual faith. It's not just believing some facts. Number two, we don't already have it. We have it in a promise. We have the hope of eternal life and we must fight the good fight and take hold of that eternal life that is where? It's not, uh, it's, it's something that, okay, the next thing is that there is, uh, that there's action and effort. By fighting to lay hold of eternal life, that doesn't mean we earn eternal life. That means we're taking hold of the promise of God. By faith, we obtain the promises, just like those in Hebrews chapter 11. And then lastly, it's not a transaction. It's a relationship. It's through Jesus Christ. He is our salvation, not that belief you had some years ago. Believing certain facts is not what saved you. Jesus Christ is what saves you. Cling to him, and he will bring you all the way to the end. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.